Well, good morning, Bridgeway. How are you guys? It's good to see everyone this morning. If you're watching online, welcome uh, to our worship gathering this morning. Would you stand with me as we worship our Lord? Jesus Christ. 
Good to see everybody. It's good to be back in the great state of Ohio. I love Ohio. We get all four seasons, sometimes in the same day, and it's a boring place to live. What more could you want? I mean, I, I went, we went to Nevada, we went to Vegas. We saw some amazing scenery on our hikes, and then we saw some interesting things on the Vegas Strip. It was, it was an interesting place, uh, nonetheless. Uh, I ate a lot of cheesecake, a lot of cheesecake. But it's good to be home. Nothing beats home church. I, I, we watched online, and uh, that kind of, it, it was good, you know, but it's still not the same as being here with you guys. And so I know some folks aren't back in person yet, and hopefully soon we'll all be back in person, right? Yeah, so we're working on that. Got several announcements, so let's go through it. First and foremost, our serving star of the week is Rachel Turton. Where's Rachel at? She's around here somewhere. Right there, give it up for Rachel. <laughs> Getting some pics for our social media while holding her kid. Just doing the mom multitask there. So great job, Rach. We appreciate all you do. If you're visiting with us for the first time, if you fill out your communication card and tear that off, drop it in the offering box on your way out. We'll donate $10 on your behalf to a Child's Hope International. Men's Bible study, so guys, this Tuesday, 7 p.m. If you haven't been, just jump in at any time. We're studying the book of James, and we'd love for you to join us, guys. So this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Ladies' prayer breakfast is Saturday at 9. If you have questions about that, talk to Aaron Webb. Aaron, throw your hand up there. So talk to Aaron if you have any questions about that. Let's keep going. Okay, 21 days of prayer. This is going to be a, a focused effort of us really... Uh, taking some steps for consecration before Easter, and so that's going to start on Monday, March 15th. I'll be preaching about that and fasting as well uh, next Sunday. Today, Pastor David's going to finish up our prayer series, but 21 days we'll have guides, and you don't have to use the guide that we provide. If you, um, if you go to a version, the app version, they have a lot of 21-day uh, Bible reading plans you can choose from, so just check some of those out, whatever fits your fancy. Um, just uh, partake in, from that uh, point of view. And then prayer and communion, Tuesday, March 16th. That's our monthly communion. And then starting point, if you're new to Bridgeway and you want to learn some more about us, sign up for this. This will take place after worship uh, on two Sundays. And so if you're new, you've been coming for a few months and want to learn some more, just sign up on your communication card, please. Good Friday, we are going to have a prayer and communion service on Good Friday, uh, so make it a, a point to be here for that at 6.30, and then uh, the next day, we're going to start our pray and go effort, so uh, I'll be explaining this more in detail next Sunday, but again, we're going to try to pray over every single house within five miles of this church building, and there's 100,000 people within that five miles, and we're going to I don't know how long it's going to take us, guys, but we're going we're gonna to pray over every single one of them, okay? So hopefully we can get it done in a few years, but we'll have certain days where we try to knock out a, a large section at a time, but pray and go is something you can do at any time. Just pick a street, grab some uh, door hangers, and uh, pray over some houses. So that'll be, again, this is all taking place Easter weekend. It's going to be a busy weekend, so we'll have our Good Friday service. We'll have a breakfast that day, that Saturday, and that's for anyone who wants to come. We'll have some breakfast, and then we'll go and pray over some houses. And then, of course, Easter, we're going to offer two services. We're going to have a 9 o'clock and a 1030, and uh, I hope, uh, hope everybody can join us for that. If you've been watching online for a while and you want to come, uh, we'd love to have you uh, for, for Easter coming up. What else we got? Kids camp. Um, you got anything on that, Brandon? Yeah, kids camp. So these are the dates uh, for kids camp. Now, kids camp covers anybody. Um, so for, for next year's grade, it's going to be in third through sixth. Um, we're going to Seneca Lake. It's out in eastern Ohio. Um, it's going to be June 28th through July 2nd. Um, and it's 
cost is one thirty five. It's actually a little bit more than that. The bridge rig is fifty bucks for anybody on the camp. So your total cost will be one thirty five, and the deadline is May first. So if you have any questions, and it's it's a great camp. It really is. Uh, we took the the kids there uh, a couple summers ago, yes. and uh, kids have gone there for I think four years. Now. Yeah. All right. And I think that uh, that covers it. If you, uh, oh, today is the last day if you want to order Bridgeway gear. We opened that back up because people were asking about that. And so we'll share a link in uh, the description of our um, Facebook live feed. And then if we got your order messed up for some reason, remind us, and we'll make sure we get all that straightened out as well. Okay. Man, we got through all that, church. Give yourself a round of applause. <laughs> I'm tired. All right, well, let's pray, and then we'll sing a couple more songs, and then Pastor Dave is going to bring the word today. Father, we love you. We thank you for uh, this beautiful morning you provided for us. Lord, it's so great to be back with uh, my faith family as we worship you together. God, we thank you for those who are watching online and maybe some tuning in for the very first time. Uh, this morning, Lord, we pray that uh, first and foremost that you be glorified in our thoughts and how we uh, present ourselves in, in spirit today because um, we're here to worship you, Lord. We pray for those who are far from you, Lord, to draw close, and from, for those who don't know you, God, that maybe today could be life-changing and eternity-changing. We love you so much, and we thank you for this opportunity. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's stand together. We'll sing a few more songs this morning.
Stars, the land, the morning sun was dead. The savior of the world was falling. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us. The weight of every curse upon The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away, it's perfect God could not be overcome. Now death is your steed, a resurrected king, I'll arrange you to feed.
I was wondering if you're going to let them go. <laughs> I could see they were ready to go, and you're, where, when, when do I leave? I want to say thank you to our pastor for the invitation to be with you this morning and to share and to conclude this uh, series that he's had on prayer. Uh, it's also good, and only your pastor will understand what I'm going to say next. It's good to see people when you're preaching. Um, I was last Sunday at a very a large church auditorium wise they seat about eight nine hundred folks and they were scattered in that building um, like flies a few here and a few here and a few here and your pastor will know what I'm talking about it is hard to preach in that kind of situation uh, preaching is a an event of participation uh, between the pastor and the congregation and you look at people and you see what they're thinking and you invite them to go with you on this journey through scripture so it is great uh, to see some real life people, uh, just not hoping that there are people on the internet uh, looking at you. This morning, we're going to be looking in the book of Psalms, and we're going to be looking at chapter 37, the 37th Psalm. I'll give you a moment to find your way to Psalms 37. Let me remind you something as you open up to that passage. It's only been in the last few hundred years that I could give you that invitation. For you see, until Gutenberg invented a printing press and the Bible was printed, common folks like us did not have a copy of Scripture. Uh, there were handwritten copies of Scripture uh, that were kept in churches and places like that. And even Gutenberg's Bible wouldn't have done most of us good because it was in Latin. It would be a while yet before there was the first English version of the Bible. And it probably wouldn't do most of us much good even then because the vast majority of the people in Europe didn't know how to read. They depended upon other people to share with them and read them Scripture. So how privileged you are today to be able to take your own version of the Bible and open it up or look on your phone or whatever and able to see with your own eyes what Scripture says there. The other thing that I want you to think about as you look at Psalms 37 is that you are looking at a reading in the Bible or a book in the Bible that's about 3,000 years old. You go home and think about that a moment. The book of Psalms is about 3,000 years old. There are some passages in that that are even older than that, like the Psalm of Moses in the book of Psalms. A thousand years later, Jesus was upon the earth. 
And Jesus quoted this book more than any other book in the Old Testament. And then Christianity began. And the pivotal book in the early church was this book. Psalms was the songbook of the early church. In fact, many of the Psalms, not only of the church, but also in Judaism. Uh, if you look in your Bible, sometimes there are notations about the kind of music that you would use to sing that. It was also the book of worship. But probably the most important thing that the book of Psalm is important about, it taught, teaches us how to pray. Our pastor shared with us on a sermon a few weeks ago on using the Bible to pray through Scripture. Well, believers have been praying through Scripture for a long, long time. Even before the New Testament era, back in Old Testament times, they used this book as a guide for prayer. And you think about it a moment. Here we've got a book, 3,000 years old, yet you find relevant this morning. Indeed, a testimony to the inspiration of Scripture. 3,000 years old. And I'm going to read a passage in the moment, and I could read many of them, but it will speak to you. And many have had the Psalms speak to you, haven't you? You could probably tell me when you memorized a particular Psalm, or maybe you could tell me you went to the funeral of your mother and the pastor read a, a certain passage of Scripture. Or maybe you found yourself in the hospital and your pastor came by and he opened up to the book of Psalm and it spoke to you. And why is that? Why, why did the book of Psalms speak to us so much? I think one of the main reasons is they are so personal. If you go through the book of Psalm and just go through it, you will find often they are written in the first person pronoun. It is not we, it's not they, it's not us, but it is I and me. You know Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not walk. He leadeth me beside the still waters, and it goes on. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. That's pretty personal, isn't it? And as you read the book of Psalms, it struggles with what all of us still struggle with. 3,000 years later, guess what? We're still struggling with the same thing. Our fear of death, our anger, worried about people who are trying to harm us, worried about our own sins. You know, the cry of David, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. That's pretty personal, isn't it? And I believe that's why the book of Psalms has always spoke, has always touched the hearts of believers. Well, let me read now from Psalms 37. And Psalm 37 is one of the Psalms of David. Obviously, not all of the Psalms are David, but there are many of them. And I find it interesting uh, in verse 25, which we'll be not looking at real particular, but Psalms 25, uh, David says this, I have been young and now I'm old. So here he is, an old man looking back. And the pastor asked me in this message to share someone from my perspective. Uh, I hate that the pastor thinks I'm an old man, but I guess when you close in on 74, you get into that category, don't you? <laughs> uh, some of you know what I'm talking about. But indeed, your perspective doesn't mean you know all the answers to all the questions, do you? But you've seen a lot. And I have seen a lot. And some of you who are my age know what I'm talking about. A lot of water has gone under the bridge. And so David is there, and he's talking about an issue, and this is what the Word of God says. Follow in your Bible. Fret not yourself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they shall be soon cut down like the grass, and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord, and do good. For thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light, and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way. Because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. 
Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Psalms 37 begins with a word that we don't use much anymore and is repeated several times in this psalm, that word fret. Now, if you would go through other Bible translations, and we are grateful for so many of them these days that help us understand the Bible, two of them use the word worry. Well, the word worry doesn't quite get to what this word fret is about. The Christian Standard Bible uses the word to agitate. It's real close to what this word means. But let me tell you in English uh, what the word fret means. The, the word fret, if you would study it, describes an animal devouring a piece of meat. I used to have an old dog, and that old dog only knew one way to eat, and that was in high gear. I don't know. I mean, you threw it down. Once he saw that food, he just didn't lift his head up until it was all gone, and he was looking at the bowl. You'll probably have had some dogs like that. You know what I mean. What was that dog doing? He was devouring that food that he had presented before him. We don't use the word fret much anymore, but we use the idea of fret. Have any of you said about a fret or a problem in your life? That is eating me up. That's fretting, isn't it? That's a little bit more than worry. When something is just eating you alive, that's fretting over it. The other way this word fret is used, and it gets real close to what is used in the uh, original language, is rubbing against things. When you take a piece of sandpaper and rub it over a piece of wood, that grit on that sandpaper is fretting that wood away. Now, you all know there are different kinds of sandpaper. Sandpaper comes in different grits. Maybe you're working on a project, you've been working on a piece of wood, and you've did this and did this, and, and you're ready to put that final coat of uh, lacquer or whatever you're going to finish it with on. You do not use a 40-grit piece of sandpaper. You might find a 2,000. Maybe 2,000 is not fine enough. Maybe you find something that's not much more coarse than, than soda. You know, you use a, a grit in your toothpaste uh, when you have soda in your toothpaste, don't you? Well... When we come to church today, some of you have come to church with um, your problems, but your problems are about like soda. I mean, life is good today. You know what I mean? You got a few problems, but no big deal. Your frets are about that big. But some of you are here without that kind of fret. You've got that 40 and 80 grit stuff on you. I mean, you are being rubbed, and, and we use the term, don't we? When we describe that, that person, that issue, that problem has what? Rubbed me the wrong way. That's fret. Do you get the idea? Well, David begins this psalm talking about the problem of evil. And it was fretting on somebody. Uh, Have you ever fretted over evil? I have. I have seen enough problems in my life. I have dealt with enough people I have gone home sometimes, and I think if I could get my hands on that person, you know, I wouldn't do it. But have you ever felt that way? Have you ever seen a life totally destroyed by another person in a family? Have you ever seen something in the community happen because of another person? Um, I mean, that's fretting over evil. It's only natural that we look at it and we ask ourselves, how in the world could that joker get away with that? And this is what this man was doing. He was fretting over that. But... There are other kinds of frets that we have, and in Psalms 37, we are giving a recipe. We're giving instructions. David is giving instructions on how to overcome the frets of life. And really, when we pray, that's what we're doing. We're saying, dear God, I am facing this or this or this. Dear God, I need some help here. Well, David gives the recipe, and I want you to notice as I give it to you, Each of the words that I'm going to give in this will be a verb to begin with. That's an action word. That's something that you do. And then each of these words will be followed by a prepositional phrase. I have been um, the homeschool teacher for my fifth grade grandson since last April. It's been an interesting journey. 
Uh, Y'all who have done that know what I'm talking about, but he has been going through just recently uh, in some grammar, and they were talking about prepositions, and he had a little quiz coming up, and he had to memorize a definition. What is a preposition? A preposition is a word that gives direction to the verb. And that's what a prepositional phrase does. It tells the verb where it's going. Well, we begin there in your Bible in Psalms 37 as it starts this passage. In verse 3, the first part of this recipe. And what is the word? Trust in the Lord, the prepositional phrase. Now, if you just had that word trust, what might you put in there? Well, I'll tell you what I had put in there. Many a time, I did not go to my knees and pray to God for wisdom and direction. Um, When I first found a fret, who did I turn to? Who do you normally turn to in your frets? Yourself. We're the rugged individualist, aren't we? I'm going to solve this problem if it kills me. It might. You're going to work it out, aren't you? Give me enough time and I'll figure out what I need to do next. Who am I trusting in? myself. Do you know it's really dangerous to trust yourself at times? I remember uh, years back, it was about early, late 60s, I was still getting some education and I was studying with a very well-known Old Testament scholar who's dead now, his name was Clyde Francisco, but he was teaching to us the book of Jeremiah. And he came to that passage of the book of Jeremiah, and the Bible says this, the heart of man is a deceitful thing. And he stopped. And he took his finger, and he began just going across that group of students. He says, men, never forget, you can't trust your heart. You've heard all your life, let your conscience be your guide. If you let your conscience be your guide, you can destroy yourself sometimes. And I wonder how you could tell he was very emotional about it. And he then shared a story. That week, he had been on a trip. He had been to an airport. He was waiting in an airport waiting room. A former student showed up. The man had been pastor of a really big church, a well-known preacher at that time. He let his conscience be his guide. He blew up his marriage destroyed his ministry. And he sat down by his old professor and said, oh, I wish I could rewind the clock. Oh, I wish I had never let my conscience be my guide. You can't trust in yourself, folks. The reason I pray, the reason you pray, is that we need God's wisdom, not our wisdom. The other thing we often do is what? Trust other folks. And that's good. I'm, I'm so glad for friends. I've been through a, a rough time in the past 12 months, and I could tell you all day about how important friends and family have been, and we need our church family. But do you know sometimes our best friends and our best family are not the people we ought to be trusting? One of my favorite books in the Bible is the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is not in house arrest. He is in the dungeon. He is awaiting his execution in Rome. And he writes these words, all have forsaken me. Now that's a pretty profound statement because Paul had had in Rome quite the entourage at times. There there was a moment that Paul had the authors of two-thirds of the New Testament in one room. Think about that. And then you go through there, you uh, you got Luke there, you have Barnabas there, and you have Timothy there, and you have uh, probably Simon Peter at times, and you have John Mark. I mean, it goes on and on like the who's who of the New Testament. What friends to have had. But here he was in his darkest hour. He was alone, or almost alone. Guess who was still there? Old faithful Luke, still writing, still right there with Paul to the bitter end, I think. But he says, all have forsaken me, and then it goes on in that verse, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me to guide me and comfort me and lead me. That's why we don't trust in others. There comes a moment you will be all by yourself. There won't be other folks to be there. And so the Bible begins there warning us as we pray, the reason we pray is we need God. 
But then it goes on in this recipe in your Bible. It comes to that next verse, verse 5. Commit the verb. And then what comes next? That prepositional phrase. What do we commit? We commit it where? Unto the Lord. Well, that's tough. Um, because we like to commit our problems to other folks. We like to uh, carry our burdens alone or, uh, you know, take care of them alone. But you know, the time comes, you can't bear your burdens alone. You all know the gospel song, I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. I remember when Billy Graham used to have his great big crusades and George Beverly Shea would sing, um, the choir often would sing this song, Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Why? We can't bear these burdens alone. But guess what? We try to do it, don't we? And we wear ourselves out, and then what do we do? Uh, we try to find some other folks to bear them. I was a pastor for a long time, and there were weeks, I, I mean, you'd be completely wiped out, and you knew there were certain people in your church, and you saw them coming. You tried to duck out of their way, because Why? They had another load they wanted to dump on you. You know, they, they had their burdens. They didn't want to carry their burdens, and they wanted to give you their burdens. Well, there comes a time you get tired of trying to carry everybody's burdens, but we all got our burdens, don't we? Um, right initially, a lot of us today have our burdens of family. Family's a very complex thing, isn't it? Brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles, grandma, grandpas. Uh, I had a a friend called me, I was at Kroger the other day, and he, he, this guy's a lawyer, and just, just a buddy, he's been a friend for a long time, and he called me up, and he has real problems with grandma right now. It's a burden. What to do next? My wife and I, we have a, our oldest daughter. When she was a young adult, she about killed us. She put a burden on us that I think back, I, I don't know how we were going to handle it. And, and finally, we came to that point. My wife and I had cried enough tears, and I had worried enough worries. We said, we're going to have to turn this one over to the Lord. We can't carry this burden alone. Some I mean, of you know what I'm talking about if you've gone through some things with your kids. You come to that day, you say, Lord... The foundations were laid, and I don't know what's going on here, but we can't carry that burden alone. Well, my daughter lives in Texas now, and I'll get a couple of calls every week. And here in recent times, I can tell at her conversations, she, she's looking back and looking back and looking back to her mom and some things she was taught as a child. Well, the Lord is doing some things that we were never able to do. Um, sometimes we've got the burdens of some awful people in our lives, aren't are, are there any of you uh, fix some type people? You're trying to fix some folks. Um, you know, you're going to get them straightened out. Can I tell you something? If you don't know it already, there are some folks you cannot fix. Try as you might. There are some folks, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to turn them over to the Lord. And then there is the issue of uh, our health. You all know my wife about a year ago passed away totally unexpectedly, never been sick a day in her life. Got up, we had our coffee, planned her day, and within a few moments there, she went to be with Jesus. And I had a friend say, man, and in fact her brother said as he preached the funeral, how many of us wish that we could get up one day, sit, drink our morning coffee, sit in our easy chair, and go home to be with Jesus? But that's probably not going to be the verdict for most of us, mightn't it? One of these days, you're going to go to a doctor, and he's going to give you a great big fret, isn't he? He's going to tell you some things you wish you'd never heard in your life, and you're going to have to deal with those frets. That's tough, isn't it? About a couple of years ago now on Labor Day, I had been going down. I'd been to the doctors. They tried to figure out what was going on. Um, they were running me from this kind of test to that kind of test, and I was just still going the wrong way. My wife was worried sick about what was going on with my health, and 
um, I have a son and a daughter who both work at Christ Hospital, and they began working on me, saying, Dad, you've got to get some help somewhere else. You're not getting the answers that you need to get. And finally, Labor Day weekend, about 7 o'clock at night, my son shows up. And you all don't know Christian, but he is a laid-back, calm, easygoing type guy. I never heard him raise his voice at me in his life. But I saw another young man that night, not mean about it, but he put his foot down, firm. Dad, I don't know what's wrong with you, but you're getting in the car, and we're going to the emergency room at Christ Hospital. And we went. And within minutes after they got me in there, everybody went crazy on me. They started poking me with this and putting this on me and putting oxygen on me. And I thought, what in the world is going on here? Well, to come to find out later, I was in stage five kidney failure. My doctor says, you almost didn't make it. Well, I spent some nights in that hospital, never been there in my life. I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital room at night by yourself, but it gets pretty rough, especially when you go through that kind of issue. And my, my kids would show up. Both of them worked night shift at the hospital, and they would come and eat their lunch, they called it, about midnight. And uh, we would chat back and forth. And then they would leave, and the rest of the night I would be there alone. Me and the Lord had some very deep, deep conversations. I've been a pastor, and I've stood up many a bedside, and I've read many verses of Scripture, and telling people, you cannot bear this burden alone. Let's share this with the Lord. But me and the Lord had a talk. Lord, I can't die. You can't let this happen, Lord. I've got a wife, and I've got grandkids, and I've got this, and I've got that. You know, and I fretted, and I worried, because that's what fret is all about. That's why we pray. And I finally came to that point of what? I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear these burdens alone. Well, the Bible tells us to do what here? It says, commit. And then I jumped over verse 4, but back to verse 4, it says, delight. And then the prepositional phrase, delight thyself also what? In the Lord. You know that word delight? It means to find your satisfaction, to find your peace. How can you delight in the middle of your frets? Have you ever thought about that? Remember the song of, uh, you probably sang it when you were a kid about uh, Paul and Silas in the prison singing a song praising God? Uh, that's odd, isn't it? How in the world do you get in prison and have a song service? How do you praise God in a situation like that? But that's what was going on there. They were in the middle of their, their problems and people looked at them. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, our pastor shared an illustration in one of his sermons about the song, um, It Is Well With My Soul. Um, the author of that song, Horacio uh, Stafford, was a very successful lawyer in the mid-1800s in Chicago. The Chicago fire, you've all heard about that, wiped him out. Shortly after that, he had five kids, but his youngest child, a boy, died of scarlet fever. And because of all of that was going on, he thought it would be a good thing for the family to take a vacation to Europe. And so he sets it all up. And at the last moment, he had a business thing come up. He couldn't go and get on that ship, so he told his wife, I'll come on another. And they took off. And midway through the journey, that ship collided with another ship. And in 12 minutes, it sunk. The four kids, girls, died, drowned. And... A sailor found Anna Stafford trying to cling on life in the ocean and drug her out, and she survived. And she sent a telegram or a cable, whatever they used at that time, to her husband. Saved only me. What do I do now? Everything was gone. And so Stafford tells his wife, I'm coming as soon as I can get on a ship to get to England. And on the way, he wrote a song. Now, if you go to the Library of Congress, you can see the original manuscript at the Library of Congress of our country. It was written on a piece of stationery from a hotel, and it was written in pencil. And it goes like this on that first stanza, when peace like a river surrounds my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my flight thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you get the imagery? The sea billows. 
Have you ever been to the ocean? Do you know the waves always keep coming in? They just don't stop, do they? This man was looking at his life. He had seen the Chicago fire. He had seen the death of a child already. Now the four children were dead. He had seen billow after billow after billow. And then what does he say? The Lord taught me to pray. The Lord taught me how to deal with those sea billows. Lord, you have taught me about those things. Do you all realize that God never promises us there will be no sea billows? If you have lived long enough, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, there's always one out there. There's hardly a week that goes by that I don't talk to somebody that is facing another sea billow. They keep coming. The world sort of got messed up in Genesis chapter 3. This is an imperfect world, and we should not expect this world to become perfect anytime soon. The sea billows will always be there, but what the Lord does promise us is what? He can teach us to deal with the sea billows. The Lord wants us to become experts at dealing with the surf and the waves. That's what it's all about. When we deal with our frets, as we study the Bible, as we deal with Scripture, the Scripture can show us how other people prayed and how other people dealt with their problems that we can deal with our sea billows. I was told when my wife passed away last March by some good friends, David, they said, look out for the unexpected waves. They didn't quite know what they talked about at first. I had read all the books, but I began to realize the grief waves just keep coming. If any of you have lost someone loved much and part of your life, you think, well, things are settling back down a little bit, and you look over your shoulder, and guess what's coming next? Another billow. But the Lord will teach us to deal with those billows. Then there is a, another piece of advice in this psalm. And probably my most difficult thing about praying, and the Lord had to teach me a whole lot about praying, it's verse 7. Rest in the Lord. Did you get that? It's a verb, not a noun. Rest is something that you do. This word rest here in Psalms 37 is translated in some other places in the Bible. Be still and know that I'm God. If I could put it in just old English, common uh, horse sense English was, there comes a time you've got to get your hands off of it. You've got to let God be God. I could tell you how many times I've muddied up the water. I wouldn't let God be God. I'm going to fix this, God. Just sit back and watch me, God. I'll take care of this. I'll make another phone call, or I'll take this person out to dinner, or I will do this, and I'll do this, and I'll do this. And some of those things were fine. But there are some times we need to let God be God. Some of you this morning need to let God be God. You need to rest in the Lord. But then there's one other part of the recipe. We've seen the word trust and delight and commit and rest. But look at verse 8 in your Bible. Wisdom from David about dealing with fret. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Do you know that uncontrolled fret will make you do stupid stuff? You could probably give me a testimony, couldn't you? Have you ever seen in a family there is a fret, not just a worry, but a fret? I mean, it is eating you alive. It's rubbing against you horrible. And you get in that family situation, the next thing there is an explosion. People say things they regretted saying, and people hurt things, but the damage is done. The divorce is coming, or the family's not speaking to each other for a decade. Fret got out of hand. Turn on your TV tonight. Listen to the news. There's hardly a night that passes that there is not a report of some kind of domestic violence. And what caused that? Fret out of hand. But there's something else about this kind of fret, this anger. You all know you can get angry with God? I went through, as you know, all this stuff called grief. 
I should have known better. I was a trained counselor. They knew all those things, but it was like surprises kept coming. Well, step one of grief, you get mad at yourself. And so you and I were married 53 years, a great, wonderful marriage. But, but, you know, if you go back for 53 years, you can find a lot of regrets. Wish I hadn't said that. I wish I'd done that. You know what I'm talking about. I beat myself up real good. Got through that. Second stage of grief, know what it is? You get angry with God. And me and God went round and round. God, why did you do this? My, my children, my grandchildren needed my wife, and Lord, Lord, I miss her. Lord, I needed her too. Why did you do that? And Lord, don't you know what she did? She was a wonderful wife, a wonderful pastor's wife, a missionary that people even wrote articles about all that she did in her missionary career, and she spoke to women's conferences and everything else. Lord, why did you do this? Have you ever been there? If you've been in grief, you know what I'm talking about. And I had a friend came by, and we were chatting. And he said something, just punched me right in the stomach. He said, Dave, David, isn't it great? Your wife spent a lifetime telling people about Jesus, and now she is home with the Lord in heaven. And I said, Lord, I'm sorry. Heaven's a whole lot better than earth. Her place in heaven is what it's really all about. That's what she told people about. But we can get angry with God, can't we? I remember years ago when I was a young pastor, we had a couple at our church in Missouri, and they were middle-aged adult. Their young adult son was killed in a car crash. And that couple who used to t- teach Sunday school and all kinds of things, they just dropped out of church. And folks went to them and talked with them, and they didn't want to talk to nobody. They said, we're never coming back. We're angry with God for what he did to our family. Have you ever known somebody angry with God? People do that, don't they? Your threats can drive you to be angry with God. Well, this morning, I've given you a recipe. Folks have been reading this recipe, as I told you, for about 3,000 years. It's tried and proven. Lots of folks have looked at this. I just wonder how many people have cried over it, prayed over it, thought over it, wept over it, wrestled with it, everything else. This is real life. I hope this morning that as you think of your own life, You'll think about those things that you need to turn over to Jesus, those frets that you need to hand over to him. You know, Stafford, in that great hymn that he wrote, It Is Well With My Soul, he writes in the third verse these words, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. What is our biggest fret? What's going to happen to me when I die? I hope today, if you do not know the answer to that fret, what that song just said, your sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and you bear it no more more. You can roll that burden of sin over the Lord even this morning. Let's pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, I am so thankful that I can open up this great book and find words that men and women have wrestled with and prayed through and dealt with for thousands of years. But Lord, we're all here today. We've all brought our frets with us. And Lord, there's some folks here who are being devoured this morning. And I would just pray that they would discover how to turn those frets over to you. There are some folks that have had things rubbing them the wrong way and is killing them. And Lord, I pray that they too can discover what David was sharing to this man in this psalm. And Lord, I want to thank you most of all that that burden of sin was lifted at Calvary, that Jesus made it possible that we do not have to bear that burden of sin alone. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. In his name we pray.
Let's stand together, church. Missed, have a great week. Stick around for small groups afterwards. The ground began to shake. The stone was rolled away. It's perfect, but could not.